Hello, everyone. This is the 117th episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles and the Soccer Nostalgia blog. Unfortunately, Mr. Paul Whittle from the 1888 letter blog could not make it this time. For this episode, I interview former Northern Irish radio journalist, Mr. Barry McDevitt. As we discuss Northern Ireland national team during the 1982 World Cup. Welcome, Barry. Good. Uh, hello and welcome. It's uh, evening here. Can you introduce yourself and your trajectory into football? Well, I've always been a football fan from the age of 10. And that was the first time I went to a Northern Ireland international. Lucky enough, I had older brothers. And luckily, one of them was very keen in football. And fortunately, he wanted to take his younger brother, which is me, to football matches. And I was a football fan. I played football. It wasn't very much good, much good, but I loved the internationals. And I kept thinking how great it would be to be a fan. And the excitement, especially at the international matches, was something that I really loved because we had players like George Best and Pat Jennings when I was 12 and 13. And they were big players in England. I mean, George Best was just absolutely fantastic. And I always say the great thing about being my age compared to somebody younger is that I actually saw George Best play in real life, which is something that you just can't take away from. So then when I grew through my teens, um, I still followed them. And uh, in my 20s, I decided that I would really follow them. I got really into the team because they were quite a good team. And you really wanted to qualify for the World Cup finals. They had just missed it in 1966 in England and in 1970 in Mexico. They just missed it. So and 74, they didn't do well, 78. But in the coming to 1982, which is what you want to talk about, they had a great team and we had a really good chance of qualifying. And we did, of course. What was the status of Northern Ireland at international level following its loan appearance had been in 1958? So we're talking more than 20 years in the international wilderness. Well, the 1958 team, I was only a few years old at the time. I don't have any memory of that. But the 1958 team was a very good team. They had a lot of first division players from England, top, top players, and they're just a great combination of good players and some average players who really, as we say in boxing terms, punched above their weight. But then after that, some of those players retired. We went through a quiet period uh, where we just, we played the British Championship every year, which is an international competition, played every season. So there was England, Scotland, they were the big teams, Wales and Northern Ireland. And we always fought off against Wales to avoid the wooden spoon and to beat Scotland or draw with Scotland or England, you know, was a major achievement. So we were really the poor relation of them all. And in international terms, we didn't do very well either. We didn't have many international matches because there was really only the World Cup qualifiers. The European championships hadn't really got going at that stage, but we were a pretty pretty average team who got the odd success in matches, but never really had any realistic ambitions of qualifying for finals of, of any championship. Domestically, what was football's impact in Northern Ireland in social and cultural terms at this point? As we call it, the troubles, the sectarian strife broke out in about 1968-69, until then, I had been going to Indrasis for a few years and everybody went and it didn't matter what religion you were. We actually played under the name of Ireland, although we were Northern Ireland and you chanted Ireland, Ireland at matches, although there was a team from the south of Ireland, from the Republic, which was Republic of Ireland. But football and international matches were a, a big, big spectacle because we couldn't really see players on, on television then. There's very few matches shown and this is your chance to see um, players in real life can you describe the trajectory of northern ireland manager billy bingham as a player and a manager up to this point well billy bingham he was really the brains behind us doing well for the six years between 1980 
1986. He was a, a good player, but he was actually a much better manager. Very clever, very smart, very astute, but also a brilliant man manager. He could inspire anyone to play away above their ability. He played in the 1958 World Cup. He was um, playing for Sunderland in the first division at the time in England. Uh, then he decided to go into management. So in 1967, he was only in his 30, late 30s, early 40s. He took over as manager of Northern Ireland for about three years. Then he became manager of Everton in the English first division. Did quite well. Surprisingly got the sack because they expected more of him. Then he went to Greece, managed the Greece national team, and then a few clubs in Greece. He came back then to manage Northern Ireland in 1980, and that was the start of the World Cup qualifying for the 1982 World Cup. And in 1980, Northern Ireland surprisingly won the home championship. Was this really the genesis of the World Cup adventure, you think? Oh, yes, I think so. Until then, the, the, the home championship had been played over years throughout a season. You play a match in October and a match in February and a match in, in April. And then the countries got together and decided they would play it over one week, really at the end of the season. For England and Scotland, these were really friendly matches. So you played on a Saturday and on a Wednesday on the following Saturday. So the three matches were all over in seven days. And I remember going to the match against Scotland at Windsor Park, and we didn't really expect to win. We thought we would do quite well, but we won 1-0 with a great goal by Billy Hamilton, who had played for the local club Linfield. The home pitch is Windsor Park. That was Linfield's home pitch. And he'd just gone over to England to play for Queen's Park Rangers. So this is, I think, his first or second match playing for Northern Ireland, and he scored the goal. Uh, that then was followed by three days later, we played England at Wembley and held out. We were goal down, but managed to scramble an equaliser. Near the end, it was one each. And the way results went, it meant that if we went to Wales on the following Friday night and we beat Wales, I think even if we'd drawn, we would win the championship. But if we beat Wales, we would win the championship because it was two points for a win. So we get two points for beating Scotland, a point for drawing with England out of Wembley, and another two points, it was five out of six. So And they beat them. They beat Wales in Cardiff that night. And uh, unfortunately, I tried every means of going, but I couldn't get there in the time. But that gave them the belief. And Billy Bingham, he was interviewed after the match. And when you see the interview now, he said that he really believed this team could go far because he had a tremendous ability for, I say, for managing average players and inspiring them. Jimmy Nickel once said when he did the team talk in the hotel about two hours before a kickoff, he just felt as if he could go out and do anything. And on a personal experience, I remember many years later when Billy had retired as manager, him giving a talk at a football supporters dinner one night and he was riveting. He just, I felt that if he'd said to me, Barry, there's your boots, go out and beat England, I could have done it. He had this great charisma about him. But he was astute because he built the team on a strong defence, which we had. And if you have a strong defence and you don't concede goals, there's a good chance that you could score one and win matches. And we didn't score many. If we scored two goals in a game, it was pretty unusual. So we usually drew matches nil each, or won them one nil. So it was all built around the brains of Billy Bingham. Let's discuss the backbone of this Northern Ireland squad and its key players already established under Bingham. In goals, we had Pat Jennings. And Pat Jennings was a magnificent goalkeeper, very, very calm under pressure. And never was flamboyant, but always seemed to be never spectacular. He was such a rock to the defence. At the time in the 1960s, when Gordon Banks was a goalkeeper for England, it was either Gordon Banks or Pat Jennings was the best keeper in the world. And we always felt Pat Jennings was the best keeper. But of course, England is a bigger population. So 
They said it was Banks. Anyway, so you built it around Pat Jennings. Then we had Chris Nickel. All the players played in the in the first division in England. We had Jimmy Nickel, who was a cousin, but a very solid right back. Had played for Manchester United a few years earlier, although he was at the time playing in Canada. But great, very, very experienced. Sammy Nelson for Arsenal. Great midfield of uh, David McCreary. I had played in the for Manchester United. John McClelland with Glasgow Rangers. Martin O'Neill. He won the European Cup with Nottingham Forest. So he was really at the top of his game. And Sammy McElroy was playing for Stoke City, formerly of Manchester United. Guys who had been at the top, but probably just slightly past their best, but still had great experience. And that was the crux of the team. A solid defence, really solid midfield. And then we hoped for something up front with Jerry Armstrong, who was a big, strong, bustling centre forward. And Billy Hamilton, who could, quite a good runner, could cross a ball, could head a ball. We didn't have any lethal goal scorers. We never, apart from David Ailey once, we didn't have any great goal scorers. So it was built around the solid defence and then the occasional attack. But they were all, as we call, premiership players now. You know, in those days, the whole of the English First Division, which is the top division, the First Division was all British players. We didn't have any foreign players until Ozzy Ardiles and Ricardo Vila came from Argentina in 1978. So, you know, we had great experience in our team. For the World Cup qualification phase, Northern Ireland were in a group with Scotland, Portugal, Sweden, and Israel. This World Cup in Spain was the first one that would feature 24 teams. And from this group, two teams would qualify. I imagine for most observers, Scotland were seen as favorites with Northern Ireland and Portugal and Sweden battling it out for the second spot. Well, certainly Scotland were, we always felt Scotland were a stronger team than us. We felt Portugal was a very strong team. So we felt that Portugal and Scotland were really the ones to beat. Sweden were also quite strong. I think they'd been to the World Cup finals in previous years. So there were, and Israel were the weakest team. But we just battled against all the teams and picked up the points, point by point. Eventually, things went right for us when uh, Portugal lost. Amazingly, they lost away to Israel when we expected them to win. Billy Bingham had taken over in February 1980. This is two years before the World Cup finals. And his first match was in March, away to Israel. And Northern Ireland were get a pounding, but the, the, there was a floodlight failure in the second half. The players really said that saved them because they were able to regroup and they held out for a nil-nil draw. And I remember as a fan thinking, that's magnificent. You could go to Israel, to the Holy Land, for a week and take in the match. And then we were playing Scotland, which was quite convenient. Sweden is a great place for a holiday for a week. And Portugal. So they were all very attractive places. So I managed to get to, not the Israel game, because that was the first one giving me the idea. But uh, I did go to all the matches and, and the friendlies, including France in Paris away. And I think it was the only Northern Ireland fan. And uh, I went actually to 10 away matches in a row including the first three in the World Cup finals in Spain. And there were no budget airlines then. It was quite expensive to travel abroad. It wasn't something that we did. We didn't even bring fans to many British championship matches. But certainly for the game away to Scotland, which was in March 81, I think he brought three and a half thousand, which was incredible support, even though it was only just across the water. Where were you in life as this qualifier started? Well, I was in my mid-twenties. I was a a freelance journalist uh, working for BBC and Ulster Television. I did news shifts and did a bit of sport. So I had the flexibility to do different shifts and then, you know, turn my hand to different uh, things. But I used my position to go to Portugal because there were no trips to Portugal to Lisbon. I, as a freelance then, I persuaded the secretary of the Irish Football Association to let me travel with the team. So myself and a lot of journalists who I would have known 
we all travelled with the team, stayed at the team hotel, and then we got tickets to the match. It turned out that at the end of the match in Lisbon in November 1980, the Northern Ireland fans who were wearing green and white scarves, of course, we all gathered outside the ground afterwards. And I think there were 10 of us or 12 of us who had all gone there by different means, including a couple from England, from Northampton, who used to live in Belfast. So after that, I decided it would, this is this following your team away from home is a great experience if you have never done it before, because you put so much effort into the trip that you really enjoy it rather than going to home match where you turn up before the kickoff, no matter what the result, then you go home. But it's a great experience. So I decided to try and start form some Northern Ireland supporters clubs. We had had one before that. So I started a, several branches of Northern Ireland International Supporters Clubs. Did that for a few years. Then because of work commitments, uh, then I changed careers and I couldn't concentrate on following the football team. So I didn't go to so many matches, lost my interest a bit. But what I started then has flourished. And now I do, we have dozens of Northern Ireland Supporters Clubs. who We bring several thousand to each game. Sometimes it's only 250 to uh, Bucharest recently. But, you know, when I went to Sweden in 1981, I think there were 43 Northern Ireland fans. Travel was harder those days, harder and much more expensive, relatively speaking. Whereas now you, you have cheap airfares and you can book hotels online. People now like away matches because it's a great way to see a city for a couple of days. Have a good time, away from the wife, usually men. A lot of families haven't said they go, and then watching your team. And they realise it's just such an enjoyable experience watching your team play in a foreign ground. Let's look at the World Cup qualification process. It started with that match in March against Israel at Tel Aviv that ended in a scoreless tie. It would be another seven months in October 1980 where the next match at Belfast was against Sweden. And Northern Ireland won this match 3-0. Was this somewhat the catalyst, you think, for getting the confidence to qualify? You know, every match and every win gives you confidence. The draw with Israel was a, tra- a draw. It was a good, it was a point. Better than getting beaten. We usually don't do well away from home. Beating Sweden, we beat them 3-0 and we were three goals to nil up at half time. Again, that gave them great belief. That was in uh, October 1980. The next match was the one I went to with the team in Lisbon against Portugal. Unfortunately, they lost that 1-0. But, you know, they knew that two teams would qualify out of the five. So as long as we could keep in there with a chance of second place, then we would a good chance of qualifying. And the next match in, in March 1981 was away to Scotland at Hampden Park. And we had three and a half thousand fans went over and they sang their hearts out the whole night. And they had a great performance and drew, deservedly drew against Scotland. Now, that was not only a point for us, but it was a point less for Scotland. So all these, these little incremental increases. So... We now had, what, um, four points from those first four matches. Match at Belfast against Portugal in April, late April. Yeah, we beat Portugal at Windsor Park 1-0. So that was a great boost, right? Because they had beaten us 1-0 in Lisbon. So that was important to get the the points against Portugal. So then we felt go to Sweden, who seemed to be a very weak team because we'd beaten them at Windsor Park. And we were devastated. We lost 1-0. The team played terribly. But this was early June, way beyond the sea, the English season had finished. And uh, Northern Ireland had never played well in June. Uh, and they only ever played well, played away from home in June. So it was a, nearly a guaranteed 1-0 defeat. We'd lost to, to Iceland a few years earlier in June. Uh, you know, we seem to give these teams their first ever victory in years in June. So we lost against Sweden, which was a a big blow because we did expect we would get both points against Sweden. So that was a setback. So following that, then the next match was against Scotland, 
at Windsor Park. Windsor Park, under floodlights at night, with this team, who were a very, very exciting team, a real battling team. We drew with Scotland, probably should have won it. So that put us in a great position. And I think the same night that we drew against Scotland, I think Sweden lost. In these times, matches were not necessarily played on the same night, and you had to arrange your own fixtures. So the way the fixtures fell was quite fortuitous for us. But then what really gave it a, yes, a boost was that Portugal went to Israel and lost. So they were virtually out of contention. They had really dropped two points in Portugal when we expected them to win. So it came to the last match for us, which was the last match of the whole group, which was at home to Israel, the weakest team at Windsor Park. And we knew that all we needed was a draw, one point, and we were through. It was still a tense match. We won one nil, but every time that Israel got the ball and attacked, we feared that that might be one one. And when you're a goal up, you can see the goal. Then it gets a bit nervy. But anyway, we beat them one nil, and it was just a a great night that night. Great, great celebrations. Yeah. So can you describe the atmosphere following the match as Northern Ireland had qualified for its first World Cup in 24 years? Oh, just pure bliss, delirious, delirious. I remember, I mean, in those days, all matches are ticket now. But in those days, there were very few tickets except for the grandstand. So the capacity of of Windsor Park was in the region of 40 to 50,000. All of those, about 4,000 were seated. So 40,000 people were standing. So we paid cash at the turnstiles. And I remember as well as anything, it was 8 o'clock kickoff. And I went along at six o'clock to make two hours of hand to make sure I would get in and get a good position. And I was not the first. There were thousands there before me. So it was a just a, a great special night and great celebrations afterwards. And the team, the whole team did the lap of honour right around the pitch. It was just, uh, it was brilliant because we were suddenly going to the World Cup finals in Spain, which was a favourite holiday resort for people from the British Isles. So we all then thought, you know, we're going to go to Spain for the World Cup finals. Just getting there was the achievement. That was like winning the World Cup for us. Northern Ireland joined the other two home nations, England and Scotland. So there were three home nations in a World Cup, which is a rarity. As the year 1982 rolled around, was there a feeling of anticipation and excitement as the Irish were also in a group with the host Spain, or was there some concern given the lack of experience? We didn't have any expectations. We didn't realize we had a good team. We had a good team to qualify, but we didn't have any realistic hope of doing anything better than going home again. So two teams out of four qualified. We reckoned that Spain were unbeatable. Turned out they weren't a great team in reality. Naturally, there was a World Cup song that was common in those days. So you had Dana with the squad singing Your Man. What was the general reception of this? Was it also a continuation of the vibe of positivity generated from the qualification? I wouldn't build up too much into the song. I'm your man, I'm your man. I'll be in the stand. It was very... It was a pathetic song. It was just a typical of a lot of silly football songs that were doing the rounds at the time. Every time a team got to the FA Cup final in England, the team made a song. Most of them were very, very poor, uh, just catchy songs. But that, it was uh, Dana. She had uh, won the Eurovision Song Contest. She was from Northern Ireland. She had got a fairly good career. We got got Dana into this into the studio to record with uh, most of the guys in the squad couldn't sing, apart from Jerry Armstrong, who will sing at every opportunity, uh, and a few session singers, few backing singers. It sounded well, but don't ask the, the team to sing the song, you know. <laughs> uh, it was a bit of a joke, really, but nobody took it seriously. But funny, when you sing the song now, I'm your man, I'm your man, I'll be in the stand following Northern Ireland or something like that. I uh, can't even remember how it goes now. But, you know, people, when you say hear that song, pe- right. your man... 
Man because you were man gets the ball or something like that. Yeah. yeah. No, that Ireland has it all. Yeah. Right, right. So you immediately cast your mind back to 1982. But it was just one of those things they do when they have a bit of success. Well, we'll put out a song here, you know. Somebody <laughs> made a few pounds out of it, but, <laughs> but uh, I think the team were a bit embarrassed by it. The preparation friendlies ahead of the World Cup were not particularly impressive. What was the general takeaway from the public and the press at this time? As you had a home championship loss 0-4 to England in February, followed a month later with the match that you went to at Paris against France and another 4-0 loss. Now, Ian Stewart earned his first cap in his match, but that was the end of the road for Derek Spence and William Caskey. In April, you have another home championship match at Windsor against Scotland that ended as a 1-1 tie. The likes of James Cleary and Felix Healy and Robbie Campbell earned their first cap in his match. And actually for Robbie Campbell, he would only get two caps. And he's the next one against Wells, another heavy loss, 3-0 at Wrexham. There was like three losses and one tie. Nobody had any hopes at all. You know, the results were terrible. The team wasn't playing well. But to be fair to Billy Bingham, they lost the matches, but they had nothing to lose. He might as well try out some players. He was trying out some players who would be in the squad. It was the time to experiment, but it was also very disappointing for your spirit to lose. I mean, we get heavily beaten by England in February 1982 at Wembley. To, to, to play England at Wembley, we need to have a really good team and they really need to be on the ball, as we would say. But England would take you apart, and they did. And then France, same. I think England were to play France in that friendly in Paris, but because they were drawn together in the same World Cup group in the finals in Spain, they couldn't play each other. So Northern Ireland then were given the chance to play France. And again, it was just totally one-sided. 4-0 was not too bad considering. But probably the worst one was losing 3-0 to Wales in Wrexham. There were very few people at the match, only the diehard people and fanatics like myself. There was no atmosphere about it. Wales didn't even have to play well to beat us. We hit about a month or six weeks later than to Spain with all this background of a terrible record of defeat after defeat, not even scoring a goal. So our hopes were not great, but uh, hope springs eternal, I suppose. There were reports and rumors ahead of the World Cup that George Best might be selected for the World Cup. Can you shed more light on this? Well, everybody was very fond of George Best, and he didn't play in the World Cup finals, which was a shame. In 1970, we had Russia and Turkey in our group, only three teams in the group, but only one qualified. We drew at home. We beat Turkey home and away, uh, and then we played Russia at home and drew nil-nil and lost 2-0 out there, and then Russia beat Turkey. So that was George's best chance of qualifying because he was at his height, but he was way past his best uh, by 1982. In fact, probably sparked it was he'd been playing for in America for the San Jose Earthquakes, and American football then was quite poor. So they came on a tour of Europe, and they played in Belfast at Windsor Park against the local team, Linfield, who were would have been the top team, league champions. And he played for San Jose Earthquake about a year or just less than a year, I think, before the 1982 finals. And a big crowd, big, big crowd turned up just to see George Best. It wasn't a high-quality match. I remember the match. He hadn't the pace to beat an Irish league player. Now, these Irish league players are part-time, so he couldn't beat a player who was only a part-time player. For sentimental reasons, a lot of people wanted him to go, but Billy Bingham stood firm. He felt that he wasn't up to it, and to be honest, I don't know what good he would have done in the World Cup, apart from make a token appearance in one match for 10 minutes when they were already out of the World Cup. So it was for sentimental reasons, really, that people wanted him, because he would have, and as well as that, because of George's off the field record of girls and alcohol and drink, the Spanish newspapers would have had a field day. The stories they printed about 
the squad in the hotel about the drinking sessions were totally fabricated. So what would it have been like if George Best had been there? So he would have been the focus of attention in the finals if he'd gone, and that would have not been good for team morale. So just to have a, a, say a sentimental feeling, but realistically, he wasn't good enough. Ahead of the World Cup, do you remember if there was already a buzz about Norman Whiteside at all? Not really, no. I mean, he, he played for Manchester United. He made his debut for Manchester United about uh, six weeks, seven, seven weeks before that as a substitute. And he'd been on the, the second team or reserves or the youth team or something like that. This guy was only just 17, but he was a big guy. And we had heard about Norman Whiteside. He was uh, from Belfast. He was on Manchester United's books and he was a good player. But we didn't realize, you know, we hadn't seen him play. He hadn't played for Northern Ireland before he went to Spain. So we didn't know if he, how good he was. We did, you know, at 17, you don't really think anybody is up to the standard you need to be to play in the finals of the World Cup. But Billy Bingham saw him training. They had two or three weeks of a training in the south of England before they went to Spain and then in Spain for a week or so. And he saw him in the training and he realized that this guy was up to the standard. And uh, it was a, well, we were, I remember that when the team was announced in Spain at Zaragoza for the first match against Yugoslavia and they announced white side. And we thought, great. Everybody likes a guy making a debut. And especially when we had high hopes of him, but he certainly lived up to his expectation. Let's look at the final 22 selected for the World Cup. At number one, starting goalkeeper, Pat Jennings of Arsenal. Number two in defense, Jimmy Nicole at Toronto Blizzard in Canada. Number three, another defender, Mal Donaghy of Luton Town. Number four, midfielder David McCrary of Tulsa Roughnecks in the United States. Number five, in defense, Chris Nicole of Southampton. Number six, again in defense, John O'Neill of Leicester City. Number seven, striker Noel Brotherstone of Blackburn Rovers. Number eight, captain of a team in midfield, Martin O'Neill, who had now joined Norwich City. Number nine, striker Jerry Armstrong of Watford. Number 10 in midfield, Sammy McElroy of Stoke City. Number 11, Armstrong strike partner, Billy Hamilton of Burnley. Number 12 in defense, John McClelland of Rangers Glasgow. Number 13 in defense, Sammy Nelson at Brighton. Number 14 in midfield, Tom Cassidy of Burnley. Number 15 in midfield, Tom Sweeney of Cambridge. Number 16, Norman Whiteside of Manchester United. Number 17, backup goalkeeper Jim Platt of Millsborough. Number 18, John Jameson, a striker from Glen Torren. Number 19 in midfield, Patrick Healy of Coleraine. Number 20, midfielder James Cleary of Glen Torren. Number 21, striker Robert Campbell of Bradford City. And number 22, another goalkeeper, George Dunlop of Linfield. Now, of the players in the final 40 who failed to make the cut, you have goalkeeper Eric McManus of Stoke City. As far as defenders, you have Paul Dixon of Burnley, James Hagen of Coventry, Jared McElhinney of Bolton, Sean O'Neill of Chesterfield, Pat Rice of Watford, and Roy Walsh of Linfield. As far as midfielders, you have James Harvey of Hereford United, Vic Moreland of Tulsa Roughnecks in the United States, John Sloan of Ballymena United, and Tom Sloan of Manchester United. As far as strikers, you have Trevor Anderson of Linfield, William Caskey of Tulsa Roughnecks in the United States, George Cochran of Middlesbrough, Jerry Mullen of Glen Torren, William Murray of Linfield, Derek Spence of Southend United, and Ian Stewart of Queen's Park Rangers. 
It was, uh, I'd never been to a World Cup before, but when you read out the names there, I'd forgotten really who the extra players were that didn't make the 22. But in that extra list between 22 and 40 were about six players who played for Irish league clubs and they're part-time players. So we hadn't much strength there. Some other players had just were had just been transferred and were playing for lower league clubs in England. But Ian Stewart, who you mentioned last there, didn't make the 22. He then, he maybe should have been in that 22. He played for Queensborough Rangers. Of the 22, four were Irish league players, part-time. They went to the World Cup finals. But the starting 11 or 12 or 13 that he, he chose from, they were all strong players, all either played in the first division or in the case of Jimmy Nichol and uh, Dave McCreary were playing in America. But that was just to for match practice. They were just, they had been with Manchester United for years and were still good players. So we couldn't have fielded a strong second 11, but we had a very solid first 11. Uh, and then the rest of them in the 40, the list of 40 were just really I mean, I could have got on that team, <laughs> if you know what I mean. It was a, They're very, very, very weak once they get down to, to, tw- to 22 or so. To get the speed, with no direct flights from Northern Ireland, but there were holiday packages from Dublin run by a couple of firms. So you could book on a holiday package to Benidorm, which was about 70 miles south of Valencia. So a lot of us went on those. And the, the way the schedule worked out was that Northern Ireland had one of three matches in Valencia, which is only 70 miles away. And the first two matches against Yugoslavia and Honduras were in Zaragoza, which is about 250 miles north. But we just hired cars. Some people went on buses. The advantage also of being in Benidorm, which is near Alicante, which is south of Valencia, was that there was another World Cup group taking place in Alicante and Elche which is only 30, 40 miles from where we were. And they were on different nights. So we could go to see Maradona playing for Argentina against Hungary and against El Salvador. And we all, also, I remember going to the match where Hungary played, beat El Salvador 10 goals to one, that which is a record score. So it wasn't much of a match, but at least I could say is was that the highest goal scoring match in the history of the World Cup. But um, it was a great atmosphere in in Benidorm, which is the holiday resort, because there were Scottish fans there too. And the Scottish matches were played on different nights from us. So we would go into the bar and watch their matches and cheer on the Scottish team. And they were in Brazil's group, you know, in Russia. So uh, just the whole fortnight was just football and sunshine. Let's take a look at Northern Ireland's World Cup itself. They started on June 17th at Zaragoza against the much-fancied Yugoslavia. Now, for this match, Northern Ireland started with Jennings, Jimmy Nicole, Donaghy, Chris Nicole, McClelland, McElroy, Martin O'Neill, captain of the team, McCreary, Armstrong, Hamilton, and the international debutant, the 17-year-old Norman Whiteside. In fact, Norman Whiteside became the youngest ever player in the World Cup finals, overtaking Pele's record from 1958. He was 17 years old and 41 days. So the match ended as a scoreless tie. Yugoslavia had been the favorite team, so a point was a good result. And But of course, really the takeaway is the debut of Norman Whiteside in terms of historical significance? Yes, I mean, we were very surprised when he was chosen. But when he played, we realised that he was up to the standard. And he did not look like a 17-year-old. He was a big, strong lad. And he could hold his own on that international stage. And Norman, of course, later years, would joke that not only was the youngest player to play in the World Cup finals, he was the youngest player ever to get booked. Yeah, yes, so, yes. But he was a tough player. In those days, you could tackle a lot harder than you can now. And he was made for the time. He certainly was not to be messed about with. The next match was against Honduras on June 21st, again at Zaragoza. 
And for this one, Northern Ireland would have been the favorites. However, Honduras had just come away with a 1-1 tie with the host Spain. So they were not to be taken lightly. For this match, Northern Ireland started with Jennings, Jimmy Nicole, Donaghy, Chris Nicole, McClellan, McElroy, Martin O'Neill. He'd be replaced by Felix Healy in the 77th minute, McCreary, Armstrong, Hamilton, Norman Whiteside, and he'd be replaced by Brother Stone in the 86th minute. Ireland took the lead early. In the ninth minute, Sammy Macro's free kick from the left side, it hit the bar. Another header was parried by the goalkeeper, and Armstrong headed in the rebound. However, Honduras tied a match in the 60th minute when a corner kick from the right side was headed in by Antonio Leng, and the match ended as a 1-1 tie. So two matches, two ties. What was the reaction afterwards given that I imagine Northern Ireland would have seen this as the one match they potentially could have won? We were very disappointed, very disappointed. I mean, you said that Honduras played well to draw with Spain uh, the previous week. Well, Spain were actually lucky to get a draw out of that match. I think it was a controversial penalty kick that they got to equalise. But we didn't regard, still didn't regard Honduras as a serious contender. We're not good at playing the smaller teams. and But we dominated that the Honduras match for a while. Then they dominated the game and they really should have won it. But we were devastated at the end. We thought this was our chance really gone and the players were so devastated we we actually wanted i remember the experience at the end we wanted to applaud the players off the pitch but they didn't come anywhere near the crowd and we were really disappointed at that but they said later that they were so disgusted at the result that they didn't have the the heart to come to the supporters but you support your team through thick and thin and they'd got a draw they didn't lose, and while we wanted to win, we wanted to cheer them off the pitch to encourage them. So everybody was very disappointed. The last match in the group was against the host Spain on June 25th at uh, Valencia. For this match, we have Pat Jennings in goal, Jimmy Nicole, Mal Donaghy, Chris Nicole, McClellan, McElroy. He'd be replaced by Tom Cassidy in the 50th minute. Martin O'Neill, captain of the team, McCreary, Armstrong, Hamilton, and Whiteside, and he'd be replaced by Sammy Nelson in the 73rd minute. This match would be the highlight of Northern Ireland's World Cup. In the 48th minute, they scored a winner to defeat the hosts. Billy Hamilton's cross from the right side was pushed out by the Spanish goalkeeper Arconada and Armstrong just volleyed in and gave Northern Ireland the lead and the eventual winner. However, there were some tense moments as Mal Donaghy was sent off in the 61st minute. This win against a host is a much referenced historical event. Can you describe the atmosphere and the significance of this win? Well, it was totally unexpected. At the, at the match itself, there was a, a very enthusiastic Spanish crowd, but and we, we weathered the storm for the first 15, 20 minutes. The team did, and we didn't have any hopes at all. It was only a matter of when would Spain score and when would they win the match. I remember vividly, and other people have said this too, we were at one end of the ground. It was all terracing, mainly terracing. We were standing at one end of the ground on the top deck and they scored at the other end of the ground. And when Jerry Armstrong hit the net, the crowd went silent. So you always expect a cheer whenever a team scores. I mean, our fans at the far end cheered, but because the general crowd went silent, we didn't really believe it was a goal. We thought something has happened that maybe it's been disallowed. So our instant reaction wasn't great, you know, was scored. So it took a while to, for us to sink in that we actually had taken the lead. Then a few minutes later, then Mal Donaghy was sent off down right in front of us. 
for a nonchalant, you wouldn't even call it a push, but the South American referee, who was very inexperienced and should not have been chosen for the match, I think he sided with the crowd and he was a bit of a showman and he brandished the red card for something that was nothing at all. It was a disgraceful decision, but that made our players much more determined. Ten players against the host nation. We were behind the goal and we what we were afraid of all the time was not really the Spanish attack. We was afraid that the referee would give a dodgy penalty because in those days it wasn't VAR. And once he gave the penalty, you were done for. And so any sort of contact in the penalty box, we were really scared of that. But Spain didn't really produce any great chances. But I remember, and after the match, it was terrific. And we waited around for the team. And there was a bus trip from Benidorm, the holiday resort where we were at. A bus trip to the match was organised. And the, the holiday representatives, the holiday reps, the girls who ran it, held the bus back for a long, long while until for us to come to get it. But we decided not to get the bus because, you know, we would just get a taxi back. So the bus eventually left. But we, we said for a long, long time in Valencia that night, I've spoken to people since then, people who watched it on television at home, everybody watching on television in the same attitude as us, we have no chance. We're playing the hosts, even the BBC commentators and pundits in the studio give us no chance at all. Nobody said we would even get a draw. So they ended up with egg in their face. But the Northern Ireland fans who were sitting at their home watching on television, they were really tense the whole time. And that's the disadvantage of watching a match on television because we could see the whole pitch. We were behind the goals. We could see any threat developing from the Spanish attack. And there was no danger. But on television, you've got a restricted view. So you can't see the whole picture. So you're always worried that something's going to happen. At the ground, you feel much more in control of things. So it was just interesting that I remember coming back and a couple of days later, people were saying, oh, you're at the match. You're at the match. I mean, I was treated like a hero as if I'd played in the game, you know, <laughs> because they had watched the match. And they I thought it must have been fantastic to be there. It was actually much more tense watching it on television at home than it was to be there. But it was still very, very exciting. Very exciting. Great night. It was said that the qualification had surprised the Irish themselves, as many of the players had already booked holidays after the first round. And of course, now these plans had to be rearranged and even new extra kits had to be ordered. I think some of the players had provisionally made holidays. They had a bonus scheme where if they got through to the semifinals, they would get certain bonuses. So they had provision about financial rewards, but realistically, they did not expect to win. But Billy Bingham played a very good move with the players on the morning of the match. He pretended that they wouldn't qualify. So he went round some of the players who were based in England and said to them, John, we've decided to change your flight tomorrow, meaning the day after the match. So we're, we're you're not flying to wherever, you're flying to another city. And went round two or three of these players and they thought, but well, what's this about? I mean, we think we can win it. And the manager is talking about your flight's home tomorrow. But it's great psychology because that made them even more determined. But of course, Bingham, the whole time, you know, he applied himself correctly to the match. And this is just a, a psychological move to try and worry the players and make them more focused. I mean, the Northern Ireland Football Association, the RHFA, had no plans for a hotel. They had not looked at any hotels for the second round. And they ended up staying in an airport hotel because they had a sudden... Lucky enough, they had, from the Friday night to the following Thursday, they had that time to make accommodation preparation for the next round. But they were not prepared at all. It was actually very, very naive and an amateur attitude. They should have had something planned just in case. But they did not believe would qualify. I mean, we really didn't believe would qualify. But you have to, when you're involved with the team, you have to make preparations. I, I certainly, I flew home the next day. I know I've heard of one story of two guys who w were flying home at two o'clock in the morning from Alicante Airport, which is about 80 miles from Valencia. 
and they weren't sure whether they should go to the Northern Ireland match or not. And they decided to go to the match and then get a taxi from the ground straight to the airport. And when they got to the airport after the match, Northern Ireland having won, they were treated like heroes <laughs> because as if they played in the match. For the second round, Northern Ireland were in a group with Austria and France. The first match was against Austria at Madrid at uh, Atletico Madrid Stadium, Estadio Vicente Calderon. For this match, Pat Jennings did not start in goal. Jim Platt of Middlesbrough started. I imagine he was injured, right? He was injured, yes. The rest of the squad, we have Jim Nicole, Sammy Nelson started, but this would be his 51st and final cap. His first cap had been in 1970. You have Chris Nicole, John McClellan, McElroy, Martin O'Neill, McCreary, Armstrong, Hamilton, Whiteside, and he'd replaced by Brother Stone in the 66th minute. And by the way, this was the first ever meeting between the nations, amazingly. Northern Ireland taking the lead in the 27th minute when Armstrong crossed from the right and Hamilton headed it in. Austria tied the match in the 50th minute through Bruno Petzai. Uh, and the Austrians take the lead in the 68th minute through Reinhold Hintermeyer, who scored from an indirect free kick. However, Northern Ireland tied the match in the 75th minute when Jimmy Nicole crossed from the right side and Hamilton headed it in. 2-2 tie, and the group was still open for anyone to win. Even though we'd beaten Spain, I think we still didn't expect to do anything in the two matches against Austria and France. And I remember when Billy Hamilton headed in the first goal to take the lead, I thought, this is unreal. I mean, we were in the quarterfinals. It was an unusual situation where you had three teams in a group, so they couldn't all play in them one night. So France had beaten Austria, and then we played Austria. And then the last match was France against us. So, I mean, we still didn't really think we'd beat Austria. But to take the lead was incredible. And then it was not unexpected when Austria then reversed it and went 2-1 up. And then to equalise it you know, near the end was, was great. It was just great to get a result out of it. But it meant that we still had a chance in the last game because we had one point and France had two points. The two of us then played in the last match a few days later. We had to beat France. Now, remember that French team is very, very good. In fact, they really, they really should have won it. If it hadn't been for the German goalkeeper. I think that you know they were good enough to win it, and they were unlucky not to win the World Cup. So that was the quality of team we were playing. So we were delighted, just delighted to get the draw against Austria. The match against France was on July fourth at the same venue at Madrid at Estadio Vicente Calderon, and like you mentioned, this is the France of Michel Platini, Alain Gires, Dominic Rocheteau, Jean Tigana. Very good side. For this match, Pat Jennings was back, and you have Jimmy Nicole, Mal Donaghy back from suspension, Chris Nicole, John McClelland, McElroy, Martin O'Neill, McCrary. He replaced by John O'Neill in the 86th minute, Armstrong, Hamilton, Whiteside. France would win this match 4 1. However, when the match was scoreless, Martin O'Neill scored a goal, which was disallowed for offside, but later television replays, I think, showed that it was actually a valid goal. I don't think it would have made any difference as far as the actual outcome because France were just unstoppable that day. Alain Jures opened the scoring in the 33rd minute, and then in the second half, Dominic Rosto scored twice. Jerry Armstrong pulled the goal back in the 75th minute, but Alain Gires rounded out the scoring in the 80th minute, and France deservedly won for one. 
like you said, the France were one of the best teams in the tournament at this point. It was certainly no shame to lose to a team like this. No, but it was in the second half, we knew it was the end of the road. It was such a pity that Martin O'Neill's goal was not allowed, but it was really bad refereeing. It was bad. It was, he played a 1 2. With, I can't forget which. He was outside the box. He played a 1 2. The ball was past him. He ended up about 15, 16 yards out and he slotted the ball past the goalkeeper. A beautiful, simple goal. At the time, we didn't really query because it was fast moving. We didn't query whether he was offside or not, but just accepted it. But you really, when you see television replay, he was actually well onside. And Martin O'Neill says, you know, that if that goal had been allowed, he said we would have beaten France. Now, that's a player talking. It's hard to know, but certainly matches can change on one goal. And while that goal was early on, we had to, to beat France, we had to score first. And for France to take the lead, it was going to be very, very difficult for us, especially in the heat of that Sunday afternoon, to turn the game around, which we needed to do. We had to get both points. But it was a pity because you always think, in football, you always think about what if and the maybes. And that was our what if and maybe because things had gone. We, we could, could we have held out for a 1 0 win? If we had been 1 0 up, pressure would have been in France. They might have been very edgy. They might have, might have even played their best game, but they played well because they were relaxed and they were in charge. And it's easy to play well when you're winning, but it's not to play easy to play well when you're under pressure. We're very good at that. We're very, very good at defending a one goal lead, as was shown against Spain, although this is a a far France is far better quality team than, than Spain, but anyway, it was a it was a great way to go out. We gave it our best shot. I always say here, you didn't disgrace themselves. Not only did they not disgrace themselves, they really come out uh, as heroes of that World Cup in 1982. On balance, how were the World Cup performances viewed, given that initially Northern Ireland? would have been seen as the least fancied of the home nations? Well, I mean, England did very poorly. They went out again in the quarterfinals. They were in a group with Spain and West Germany. West Germany. Yeah. This three-team group was a just a joke. You know, it was a silly way to play it. But England just didn't really perform. They were probably, they weren't, they'd beaten, they'd beaten France in the first match in their qualifying group, but they weren't good enough. They weren't in the same class as West Germany or Italy or Brazil or, or France at all. And then Scotland um, made a complete mess of their match. They were in a group with Brazil and Russia and New Zealand. So it was obviously going to be, be between Russia and, and Scotland for second place. And they made a complete mess of their match against Russia, which they should have won. So England were disappointed. Scotland were disappointed. And the only other team from the British Isles of Reserve was us. And we came out back as the, the heroes. <laughs> How significant was this adventure, given the smaller player pool to choose from, compared to, say, England and Scotland? Well, I mean, our the quality of our players, we were just picking, you know, any player who played for a first division club, you know, was in the squad. Whereas England had a wealth of talent. I mean riches galore so for us to do what we did but you know you don't need 11 world-class players to do very well in fact that's the trouble about teams like England probably that have too many great players on the chop and chains we, we had to stick with who we had but our guys were solid reliable players who weren't brilliant but were very good very good at what is it, stopping another team or being defensive or whatever. We made life difficult for other teams and that was the uh, strength of our of our team. To compare with Republic of Ireland, the 1988 Euros had triggered an increase in interest. Did this 1982 adventure act similarly for Northern Ireland? Oh yes, definitely. I mean, People wanted to go to Northern Ireland matches then. It was hard to get tickets. We even, I think, played Israel in a B international. You know, Israel in a B international. And we, we got 
a big, big crowd for that. Even now, we'd hardly get a crowd for it at all. But Northern Ireland was the thing that every sporting fan wants to be part of success. So when you've got a cricket team doing well, a rugby team doing well, or a football team, all sporting fans want to be part of it. So sporting fans who would have been rugby fans were suddenly going to the Northern Ireland matches. Hadn't gone since the days of George Best. So uh, the only way to see him. So it was great for the Northern Ireland team. They were the, the kingpins at the time. They were very, very popular. This adventure built up the confidence and Northern Ireland nearly qualified for the 1984 Euros. Let's remember, they beat West Germany twice and also actually qualified for the 1986 World Cup. So this adventure had a bounce effect. Do you think all this confidence was a direct result of this 1982 venture? Oh, absolutely. Oh, I mean, the confidence they had, they they gave themselves belief. They then believed what they could do. And you had Billy Bigham inspiring them. I mean, despite, you know, I don't know if it's us being pessimistic, despite the fact that they'd done so well, so well in the World Cup finals in Spain in the summer of 1982, their next home match was in November against West Germany in the European qualifiers. So that was a tough group when you got West Germany, who had lost in the final of the World Cup. And I remember going to the match thinking, we'll probably lose 5-1. But Bingham, it was a wet night. The Germans did not like it. Bingham played four in attack, four in attack. And we just went through the Germans. We threw everything at them and they could not cope. And we absolutely battered their goal. And we, as always, and said, we annihilated them 1-0. But honestly, I don't think they had a chance in the match. We were so... Shoemaker, I think, was the goalkeeper. And he pulled, he pulled off some great saves. So that was an example where then had belief. Our trouble, as always, was Turkey and teams like this. We lost 1-0 away to Turkey. I can't remember all the results, but we did well. We beat West Germany at home and in Hamburg. Um, and I meant that in their last, again, you know, that wasn't even their last match, but it was ours. So the way the schedule went, you know, they then had another match at home the following week, which they had to win to qualify on goal difference against us. And they did it with a few minutes left. So we had, if we had got one more point anywhere, we would have, qualified i think ahead of west germany i we would have qualified ahead of west germany i mean like west germany are a shoe and automatic entry for every championship so uh it was a terrific performance but we really our team at that time were brilliant uh, in adversity uh, and against the big guns give us a group of italy england west germany and we'll win it don't give us groups of turkey and albania you know <laughs> And yeah, and this adventure was prolonged until 1986. In closing, what is the historical legacy of this 1982 World Cup to Northern Ireland football, as well as to Northern Ireland in terms of culturally and sociologically? Was this really the zenith of Northern Irish football? I think it was because we had two successive qualifications for the World Cup. We won two British championships. The previous success was in 1958, which most people couldn't remember. So it did inspire people to play football. People need heroes. They want winners. So this squad was winners. So it had it, its, its legacy then lasted for years and years to come. We did go through a, a, a very poor patch when... We hadn't got a great team. Billy Bingham then left as manager. We hadn't got very good managers. So it was a highlight. And socially, it was great for the community uh, because it didn't bring everybody together, but it brought a lot of people together. And I remember 1982, the Republic of Ireland hadn't qualified and a lot of people in nationalist areas of Belfast weren't really that interested in Northern Ireland because they would regard themselves as Irish and maybe anti-British. But then they realised when this this wee team, as we call them, this wee team, 1982, beat Spain and suddenly everybody, you know, everybody, Protestant and Catholic and 
they all people who are not interested in football all my all wanted Northern Ireland to win. I remember my mother who was in her seventies on the Sunday we played France in the last World Cup match. My mother had no interest in football, and she said about she was gone down to her friend Mrs. So and So to watch the match. What you know? <laughs> she she was going to one of her friends to watch the match. You know, <laughs> she wouldn't have watched it before in her opinion. Her own, you know. In her own house, you know, but everybody was, everybody wanted them to do well. One thing, it, it creates great memories, great happy memories. And you never remember the defeats. You just remember the victories. And we'll always remember the 1982 World Cup and the 1986 one, but especially the 1982 World Cup in Spain. Brilliant. With that, I would like to thank you for your participation in this interview. As always, feel free to leave questions and comments. All this information is listed on the blog and podcast uploads. So thank you once again, and hope to continue these discussions on Northern Irish football history. Goodbye. Bye.